so thank you everybody for showing uh, up to this teaching. Uh, what we're going to talk about is um, a policy called revenue neutral carbon tax, or the other term for it is carbon fee and dividend. And um, yeah, basically. Oh yeah, sure, sure. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm Hassan. Um, Chaz. I'm Jonathan. Um, and just like a little background. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I mean, we're all we're all uh, students here. I'm a grad student. Uh, and I'm in, I'm in the neuroscience department. I started, um, uh, I, I knew about this, this idea uh, before I started getting involved in CTL. Um, and my involvement, the extent of my involvement was just like attending meetings and doing, uh, I didn't do anything really special, but um, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, um, I'm a sophomore. I heard about CCL over the past year. Um, so CCL is the Citizens Climate Lobby, yeah. <laughs> um, which is a national organization of uh, like an excellent organization of volunteers lobbying congressmen to um, enact carbon pricing legislation. Yeah. Um, and we're starting up a student group um, to pursue some initiatives in CCL. Yeah. So and I'm, I'm also with CCL. Oh, yes. cool. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm Jonathan. I'm a junior in computer science. And Chaz and I are working a lot with the Princeton Student Climate Lobby, which is sort of a uh, uh, like a, a child chapter of CCL. Um, we're a group of students, and we're trying to um, build build political support for climate solutions. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. So what we're going to do today is um, uh, we're going to talk about this policy. The other term for it is carbon fee and dividend. Uh, there. Reasons we can go into why you might want to use different uh, terminology for it, but um, yeah, and and so what we hope to convince you today, or at least um, uh, get you to think about today, is uh, three points. First, um, uh, why this this is a policy that can be very effective at actually reducing carbon emissions, um, and uh, two is why this policy. Uh, among all the policies that can reduce carbon emissions, why this policy will not have ne not only not have negative impacts on the economy, but uh, will it even lead to job growth and other positive uh, um, uh, things that uh, um, will uh, affect the economy. And the last thing is why we think it's politically feasible, and why um, uh, even in uh, today's America, where uh, the majority of uh, seats in Congress are held by Republicans, and uh, um, the uh, president. Um, is uh, uh, openly denying uh, um, uh, climate change, uh, we think this is actually politically feasible uh, and um, uh, could be achieved. Okay, so uh, first I'm just gonna briefly touch on the basic idea of what a carbon free dividend is, um, and then uh, Jonathan's gonna go through the uh, political feasibility and um, uh, the, the um, uh, issue of getting consensus and um, then I'm going to go through uh, something called the Rembrandt the Rem Report, which is a report which talks about the economic impacts, and then Chaz is going to share some of his perspectives, uh, uh, personal perspective on uh, working with uh, the cl a Citizens Climate Lobby, which is um, uh, the, the uh, grassroots organization that is trying to um, uh, get uh, this, this policy implemented. Okay, so the, the basic policy is we need to put a fee on carbon emissions. Um, uh, because we ultimately want to uh, reduce um, uh, the uh, amount of the carbon dioxide that is uh, emitted into the air. And uh, the way that this is going to be implemented is at the uh, point of entry, at, uh, um, of wherever, wherever we have uh, any um, uh, um, you know, fossil fuel extraction or anything that uh, will ultimately lead to uh, carbon being emitted into the air, uh, we're, we are going to charge that industry, that company, uh, with some uh, fee or a tax. Um, and so, for example, um, one gallon of gasoline uh, uh, has a certain amount of weight, uh, and that weight corresponds to a certain amount of CO2 emitted into the atmosphere. And um, which, so one gallon of gasoline would be about um, uh, one hundredth of a metric ton of CO2. And if we are imposing a one dollar per ton uh, in tax, that will translate to about a cent per gallon of gas. So when you're pumping it, if we implement this policy with, let's say, $10 or $15 per ton, that means 15 cents increase in the price that you pay per gallon. Okay. So what, what's that, what that is going to do is that's going to, uh, by itself, it's going to decrease um, the energy consumption because uh, energy is now more expensive. Now, 
Um, the, other, the other side of the coin, this is a two-sided policy, it's a carbon fee and dividend. The other side uh, is what are we going to do with that collected tax or that collected fee? We're going to distribute it among households equally. And what, what that does is that uh, increases the uh, purchasing power of consumers. So at the same time that energy prices are going up, um, the, the um, uh, consumption power or the amount of money that the consumers have is also increasing. Um, so at the end, uh, how does that make a difference? Well, um, people will be more incentivized to use um, less energy or switch to uh, uh, less uh, carbon intensive sources of energy in order to save more money. And that's a very simple um, economic incentive um, uh, uh, for um, uh, shifting our uh, um, energy uh, consumption patterns. Okay, so John. Yeah, so one of the reasons why we're so um, we're so hopeful about revenue neutral carbon tax is that it really has the has the ability um, to build like a bipartisan coalition in support of it. So um, both liberals and conservatives support it. And I'm going to talk about um, some of the core conservative values that revenue neutral carbon tax aligns with quite nicely. Um, and the first is freedom of choice. So um, rather than the government saying you're only going to get your energy through solar, or you're only going to get your energy through nuclear, um, the government is uh, just putting a tax on carbon emissions and letting people decide for themselves. It emphasizes individual responsibility. If you want to use gas, um, so be it, but it's going to cost more. So if you, if you want to use solar, um, it's going to cost less. So it's, it's all, it, it emphasizes the choice of the consumer or the business or the institution. Um, the other, the other um, value that it aligns with ni nicely is minimal government. So of policy solutions to climate change, for example, um, carbon tax, cap and trade, command and control legislation, um, carbon tax is uh, one of the simplest ways at achieving, at achieving the goals of emissions reduction. So you just level a tax at the, at the site of extraction and you you provide the money back. You don't have to go. You don't have to create a whole new government agency that dedicated to regulating um, or implementing certain pre-specified regulations. It's just a tax, and after that, you let the free market do its own job um, in response to this price signal. And so, uh, as a result, um, uh, we would. Uh, th this is one of the reasons why two very prominent um, conservative thinkers and politicians. George Shultz and James Baker, who were the former Secretaries of State and Treasury under the Reagan administration, last February have just issued a statement in support of um, what, what's effectively carbon fee and dividend. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's also, uh, also a recent study by the Yale, Pro Yale Program on Climate Change Communication has found that 49% of Republican voters and 66% of all voters um, would be in support of taxing the uh, greenhouse gas that leads to global warming. So um, yeah, we're very hopeful about, about the political fe feasibility of this policy. One of the very um, interesting uh, facts is that fossil fuel corporations themselves support carbon pricing, or uh, sorry, carbon, carbon tax as a solution, as a, as a way of de-incentivizing, or incentivizing emissions reductions. So, um, and the main reasons are predictabil predictability, simplicity, and neutrality. So predictability in the sense that if we level a carbon, a carbon tax, I'll know what the cost of my carbon emissions are in five or 10 years. In 2050, how much, how much, is, uh, how much will this oil well that I'm drilling here be costing me in 50 years? Carbon, carbon tax makes it a lot easier to calculate that. Um, in the same way, it's, it, it's simpler um, and it's neutral. So it's not saying you have to use this particular mix of renewables. Um, it's just a flat, uh, a flat price and you, um, again, you let the free market do its job. And so this, this is really uh, kind of shown by a, uh, a letter that was sent ahead of the Paris conference in 2015 by gas and oil majors like Shell and BP to the leaders of the Paris conference um, calling them to implement carbon pricing. They said that it will discourage high carbon options, 
reduce uncertainty, and stimulate investments in the right low carbon technologies and the right resources at the right pace. And they need the governments to provide them with this framework for, um, for, for dealing with climate change. Um, and it's likewise supported by ExxonMobil. Uh, yes? I was wondering, is this like when you force them to say anything in support of climate policy? Like, why would they ever have any incentive? Yeah, so, um, so they recognize that climate change is happening and that they can't continue to burn fossil fuels for like throughout the rest of the century. Um, and so of the possible policies that they could, um, uh, of possible policies, they really like carbon price because, uh, I'm sorry, carbon tax, because it's, um, it, it allow, it like quantifies how bad it is that they're emitting so much. Like it says, okay, if you want to continue burning fossil fuels, that's going to cost you. And that, and because they're profit-seeking institutions, they'll be like, okay, if it's gonna cost me that much, then, then I have a good reason to switch to renewables. It will actually be, it will make economic sense for me to switch to renewables. And so having a carbon tax lays, lays the kind of framework for, reason, for being able to do that transition effectively. Um, yeah, and all of these companies, their main job is to not go bankrupt. And the, uh, in putting a tax like this makes it easy for them to um, make, make sure that um, it won't be the case where they've switched too fast to solar and in 20 years they're bankrupt. So having, ha having this like steadily rising tax um, is a framework that they really like. Um, yeah. Are you saying that these companies are actually interested in yes. investing in other forms of energy? So I think several of these companies actually fund our renewable energy initiatives. So for example, in geosciences, um, a lot of the research in carbon mitigation is actually funded by BP. So they, they are thinking about how they're going to transition. And in their statements, they emphasize this. The, the challenge that they're facing is that they have to meet the world's energy needs while also not doing carbon dioxide emissions. So they recognize it. Um, Presumably some of them also have investments in natural gas and the carbon tax would hit coal way harder than it would. Yep. Yeah. So that that's another reason that mm -hmm. they, more nefarious reasons. But they have said they are in support of this. So um, okay, it's just a little hard to believe. But okay, it's yeah. Well, it, there there is uh, definitely a discrepancy between the official statements and some of the activities, and especially Exxon Mobil is actually known to be not quite as consistent in their actions as in their words. And the reason for that is, and, and this is actually something to recognize, is that the, uh, there's a big difference in what type of um, reserves certain companies have. And if you look at this from purely economic perspective, and you say, okay, recognizing we're not going to be able to burn all the reserves that we know exist, because then our planet would not livable anymore, some of it is going to have to remain in the ground. Economically, the stuff that should remain in the ground is the stuff that is not as easy to extract. And then we're talking about tar sands and Arctic drilling and stuff that's really hard to get out of the ground. Now, some of the companies, like Shell, have already divested from those type of activities, so they're much better positioned for this, uh, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. While ExxonMobil in particular, is very heavily invested still in those uh, stranded assets. So uh, the, the things that are going to become worthless if any reasonable carbon policy is enacted. So you have to sort of follow the money to figure out who's in, uh, in good faith and who's not. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, although it's, it is worth noting that the former and current CEOs of ExxonMobil have both issued public statements in support of a carbon tax. So like Rex Tillerson, the current Secretary of State, said in 2015. Um, but I'm just going to mention one of the uh, last group of people who think that carbon pricing, uh, sorry, carbon tax is a good idea, and that's economists. Um, uh, the vast majority of economists, uh, about 75% of them, think that the most efficient way at, to reduce emissions is to implement a, some sort of price on carbon, whether that's through cap and trade, uh, an emissions trading system, or through a carbon tax. Um, uh, and 
uh, one of the reasons an economist might support this is that it's uh, it 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 incorporates the like hidden externalities of carbon dioxide emissions into into the actual price. So it um, it's kind of like a direct way of attacking the problem, where um, you want to de-incentivize you want to de-incentivize what's causing the externality, make it cost more. Um, it, another purely economic argument that you might make in support of this that has nothing to do with climate change itself is um, that a carbon, you can think of a carbon tax as almost a type of subsidy or a subsidy for renewable energy. And, and many economists and policymakers think that uh, we're in the middle of a renewable energy revolution right now. Where solar and wind prices, like costs, are dropping more and more. Wind is now cost competitive with um, wind is now cost competitive with coal, I believe, in some areas, um, and they've been consistently exceeding their their expectations for for like lower prices. And governments, uh, so they've been surpassing expectations. And after the Paris Conference, governments have committed to investing, tw uh, doubling their investments in renewable energy. And um, studies show that this cycle of, of invest, more investment, which causes more deployment, which causes, causes reductions in costs, this is a like, self-fulfilling cycle, a positive feedback loop, which will probably um, likely lead to even more um, implementation of renewable energy. So if, if the world is probably going to be run on renewable energy in the next um, like 10 or 20 years from now, um, and the U.S. wants to maintain its its leadership as uh, like in its energy leadership, then you could see carbon carbon tax as just a way of incentivizing its transition and streamlining its transition to make sure that the U.S. keeps its position at uh, at the top in terms of energy. Um, yeah, and so that's all for um, groups that support it. So do you want to sure? Go? Yeah. Okay. So. Um uh, yeah, so Jonathan just spoke about um, uh, why we think this is actually a feasible uh, policy and it's actually, it might be possible to um, get the uh, wide range consensus that we need to actually implement it. Uh, so and this is about the practicality. Um, but what about, what about uh, um, the impacts on the economy? So what, uh, there's a false notion out there that uh, there's basically a trade-off e uh, between uh, economic growth and carbon emissions. Um, and so if you want to cut carbon emissions, that's, that means you're going to have to um, uh, uh, stop the growth of, of the economy. And in fact, uh, one of the um, uh, uh, greatest uh, reductions in U.S. carbon emissions uh, was because of the economic crisis a few years ago. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a really nice um, correlation between uh, uh, GDP, not really nice, but there's a, there's a clean correlation between GDP and uh, carbon emissions. Um, so. Uh, what CCL did is um, uh, they asked a uh, independent uh, um, uh, uh, group um, to look at the effects, the economic impacts of implementing a, a carbon fee and dividend, a rising carbon fee and dividend. And what, what this actually means is uh, we're going to start off by um, uh, $15, $15 per ton um, uh, uh, fee for carbon emissions, and that is going to increase every decade by ten dollars. Um, actually, I think so. That's 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 CCL's idea. But what 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 the Remy report um, uh, actually simulated was a ten dollar uh, start. So they start with ten dollars a ton, and every decade it's going to increase by ten dollars. So the, the the conclusions are um, uh, uh, not really dependent on where you start. Um, but yeah. So so and and they they found some interesting things. Uh, first of all. So um, uh, of the economic impacts, the, the first interesting thing is that it will create jobs. Uh, 20 to 30 million jobs will be created uh, within 10 to 20 years of implementing this policy. So this is um, just a graph of showing uh, the thousands of jobs, and the, uh, one of these is 500, 1,000, um, uh, over, over the uh, um, decades that they simulated. Yeah. Are these jobs in a particular sector? Are they yeah. saying like job creation due to renewable energy growth? Or are they saying like people actually so they, collecting the they, taxes? They and, extensively like, like split. Like you can actually, it, it, you can see the report. It's it's online. Okay. Uh, they they have it split up by sector. Uh, I think I think the majority of uh, jobs will 
um, uh, be, uh, the, the majority of production of jobs is going to be from fossil fuel industries, and uh, it's going to be in increased in um, uh, services and uh, health care. Gross the most. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. So this is a net. This is the net. This is, and they actually split it by region, too. So um, most regions will increase. There's like, um, I think around uh, Texas and uh, uh, Louisiana, Arkansas, it will decrease. So it's not, it's not completely positive. But overall, um, uh, in the United States, it will uh, increase. Um, and, and also, they, they, if you split it by um, uh, the different uh, quantiles, you see that it will help the uh, lowest uh, uh, quantile of um, uh, society. Um, and and if, they, if you also, if, as, as I mentioned, there are two sides of this policy. One is um, the increase in, in, in energy prices, and the other is the increase in purchasing power. And because of that, uh, because you're, you're distributing the, um, uh, uh, the collective tax evenly uh, throughout society, the bottom uh, levels of society will um, be uh, benefiting the most. So if you, if you look at what's the percentage of households that will um, uh, have a net benefit, uh, um, you will see that uh, in, in the lowest quantile, you get 85% will benefit, and that kind of uh, uh, decreases as you go up. Um, yeah? Do you know what methodology they used to predict this? So uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not actually well versed in that, but I, I know that it's, it's a combination of uh, looking at um, uh, data that we have from um, uh, uh, past decades and simulations. Yeah. So yeah. Remy, they, I think they put three different economic models. Um, one of them was specifically designed to look at how like a, a carbon tax would affect industries. And they also accounted for um, like uh, increased productivity due to um, like, uh, sorry, like there, it would also avoid a significant number of deaths due to reduced air pollution. So mm -hmm. they included that. For the um, the household impact study right here, this so is not Remy it's it's not the Remy report. It's it's just modeling just what if what if what if tomorrow we put in a ten dollar uh, per ton uh, carbon tax, uh, but also return the dividends, and that was um, I'm not sure about the model that I, I think the main things that were considered were like cost like the price of goods and services, and also um, and but also like the amount that one is receiving from the dividend. So do they presume that like do they presume any leaps in our technology for renewable energies, our ability to store renewable anything like that? No, I, they, no they yeah. don't actually. They, they and that's what makes the predictions even more conservative than they sure. should be. <coughs> they're based on the current state of technology. <coughs> Um, yeah, so um, another thing is that you will have a small and <laughs> modest increase in GDP. Um, I don't think the increase is as important as just the fact that it's not going to decrease um, because that, mm -hmm. that um, uh, basically undermines that idea that um, there's a trade-off between uh, um, uh, reducing carbon emissions and economic growth. Um, yes, and then um, energy prices will increase, um, so jet fuel will increase. Uh, um, uh, motor gasoline, diesel, and natural gas will increase. However, electricity will peak around 2025 um, because of um, uh, the, the shift that will be um, uh, to more renewable energies for, for producing electricity. Um, other than that, we know that we, we will get an uh, increase in real uh, per capita income um, over, over the years. Um, so you'd get something between 500 to uh, 800 um, uh, within 10 to 20 years. Um, and as John mentioned, uh, thousands of lives will be saved uh, just because there's going to be less pollutants in the air. So with improvement of air quality, you're going to get uh, about uh, 13,000. Uh, um, uh, you're going to prevent about 13,000 uh, premature deaths, which is um, by itself very important. Um, uh, results. Yeah, sorry, clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but most importantly, uh, because the whole reason we're worried about this is because of climate change, uh, you're going to get a reduction of carbon emissions. Um, so with, with, that, with that policy where you start off with $10 a ton and you increase uh, $10 uh, 
uh, per decade. Um, you're going to get um, about a third um, a reduction within 10 years and uh, um, a 50% reduction uh, within uh, 20 years. And that is very significant. Um, to, uh, to, just, to, just for a comparison, um, this is the, uh, if, so France is um, one of, one of uh, the um, best examples of a country that has um, been kind of successful at shifting its, mm -hmm. its uh, energy towards more renewable <coughs> energies. Um, so uh, um, in the uh, 80s, uh, it, what they did was they shifted their uh, electricity production to uh, nuclear. And so right now, 80% of their electricity is coming from nuclear. Um, and they, they were able to, uh, I mean, depending on how you interpret this graph, because you have, you have this peak that, that happened around the um, uh, 70s, but depending on how you interpret it, at best you're going to get a 28% uh, reduction in their emissions uh, when, they, when they shift it to nuclear. So this yellow here is when they shift it to nuclear, and this, is, this right here is their CO2 emissions, and you get a 28% decrease, which is um, pretty much the best that we ever had in any country. Um, and uh, I, I remember the, uh, with, with, the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a 9% decrease in, in emissions. Um, so uh, what, what, this, what, I, I, what, I, what I think this study is saying is, uh, with a very simple, um, really nice uh, market-based mechanism, you can really uh, decrease um, carbon emissions very effectively, uh, much, more to, uh, uh, much more effective than any other um, uh, uh, um, you know, just uh, dictated top-down policy, like let's shift to nuclear energy uh, this way. Um, yeah, so um, Chaz is going to provide us with some of his uh, personal um, uh, insights on uh, how it is to work with CCL. As yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so I'm just going to give a little story of me and climate change. Um, I first heard about climate change when I was 11. I was sick home from school with a stomach flu, and I watched Al Gore's documentary, mm -hmm. Free and Truth. Um, and then, you know, my 11-year-old self was really struck by, one, the immensity of the problem, um, but also kind of a sense of hope that, you know, we can save the world, this can get done. Um, and since then, I've had almost a decade to get really cynical about the issue. Um, I just kept running into this same narrative that uh, climate change cannot be solved just because of the U.S. political situation. Um, there's a bit of hope uh, in the Obama years that something could get done, um, cap and trade was in Congress, but didn't get through. Um, came to Princeton, learned about, more about climate change in my freshman year. Um, just got increasingly cynical that anything would get done. Then I heard about CCL um, and went to one of their meetings. Um, and I had this completely different picture of just getting things done on climate change. Um, I, it's really, um, I got to see like democracy in action. I got to see people talking about building relationships with Republicans and Democrats, um, how to uh, tailor your message to a um, particular uh, congressman's, uh, you know, their constituents' needs. Um, and I just started to get really hopeful um, about actually getting something done on climate change. Um, I got in touch with my home district. I was able to uh, attend a meeting with my own representative um, and really just work with uh, an incredible group of people from all sorts of ages and backgrounds. Um, one person that really stood out was um, a local who was temporarily homeless um, and living out of her car, but she was still took time to participate um, in this meeting with our representative, and we were able to have this really great discussion um, with him. Um, so, yeah, I guess like the narrative I had before is that. Um, there's just too much influence from fossil fuel industries in the government, um, and they just had too much lobbying power. Um, but this new narrative that I'm coming up with is that citizens um, really can kind of shift that power just by being lobbyists um, and working with uh, groups like CCL. Um, our representatives may not always agree with us on issues like climate change, but they're still technically we're still their employers. They're supposed to work for us, and we can really we really supposed to have that power to influence the points of views. Um, just more about CCL that made me hopeful. It's this national and I think partially international organization. Um, it has chapters all over the country, um, growing chapters in really conservative di districts and um, all sorts of places that are, uh, yeah. So that's generally why CCL made me hopeful. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Are you, I don't want to interrupt, but I, I was just going to build on, I was just in Washington lobbying New Jersey congressmen and senators on climate and climate issues, and you have no options. Um, it's fine. You're going to get you're going to get the money that you need to pay for the gas. But but that would be less. You get less money than you would have to pay. To no, no. On, on on I mean the the graph that I showed you. Um, most most households um, will will receive. I think 58 percent of households will get a net benefit. Oh. And most most th those households that will have a net benefit are on the bottom quantiles. So the the, the most vulnerable. Um, so the people that can already afford to you know uh, afford to um, uh, um, you know pay more money. And the, re the reason is very simple, is that the people who have a lot of money have a lot more expensive toys or use fossil fuel. And yeah. they, can, they can do an alternative when they get to that point and buy a Tesla. Yep. You know, $100,000 car. So they're, they're fantastic. But there, there is a bigger point, and that's actually one of the challenges, is that they're, they're going to be losers in the system. Yeah, there will be. They're going to be winners, and they're going to be losers. And for instance, uh, and CCL has actually done a really good job at mapping out uh, the effects, for instance, on agriculture. Agriculture is a big concern because they're big users of fossil fuels, and um, not just in their operations as um, uh, transportation but uh, and machinery operation, but uh, fertilizer is a very big consumer of mm -hmm. fossils as well. Uh, the, so um, there's even within agriculture, there's, there's going to be huge differences in impact. So. Uh, um, a farmer in Kansas might see a relative advantage with the system versus a farmer in Iowa who might see a relative big disadvantage. That, those are the things that are really difficult to resolve, of course, and uh, that's what's going to take a tremendous amount of effort. To do that. Uh, on the other hand, with climate change, there's going to be lots of winners and losers as well. So right. it's, uh, if you don't people do anything, now with transportation will lack thereof are losers. So hopefully it'll ins inspire more public transportation, like trains in certain parts of the country. Also, like one of the concerns I think is we were just discussing was is that some areas of the country are going to have face much more costs, like especially rural areas with large rural populations, um, and they make up a disproportionately large uh, representation in Congress. And so I'm wondering, you know, even if you have these very conservative mechanisms. That could uh, that implement the law and like that would make it more appealing to that philosophy. If your constituents are not, if like a majority of your constituents would would be happen to be the, the, the losers who are concentrated in this portion of the country under this plan, how would you find the votes? So I'm wondering, like, you know, are, what are the what are the kinds of like mechanisms that you could like tack on to this plan that might make it more uh, appealing? Like, could you inc include like a geographical adjustment for this for the dividend that goes back to people? Like, rural areas, maybe they get more because they have to do a lot more driving, they're employed in agriculture industries, or like, does that take away from, you know, the appeal of it to other people and the simplicity of it? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what, what is, the is there a conversation about that with businesses and with leaders in Congress, or like, where does that matter? Well, like I said, this is the beginning. I'm sure there could be some. The, the, the real answer is not, not really. We're trying to create the political support for the concept first, mm -hmm. but you can be sure that in the implementation, this type of thing will happen. Yes. Yeah. So That's a really, just, really good question. Yeah, and this, this is just a, a map showing that, um, what, what regions will um, benefit from the policy, which um, is, is going back to your point, because um, uh, central regions um, we'll get less benefit than other regions. But no one has negative benefit? No, this is the, this is the percentage that has positive. So if it's more than 50%, then less than 50% are going to have negative. But in those oh, regions that have, yeah. Even in New Jersey, northern New Jersey, there's nothing Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I guess we're almost out of time. Uh, I just uh, uh, wanted to. Uh, mentioned that I think right right now there is a, a very promising uh, proposition uh, on the table, and um, our job is just to um, uh, you know, uh, spread the word and uh, you know get get uh, get people to 
learn about this and, and know that there's actually a promising solution. Because right now what we're lacking is consensus. What we're, what we're lacking is um, a political uh, will to actually just implement this policy. It's not that, it's not that um, uh, we, we are um, uh, held back by the lack of a, an existing solution yet. I just wanted to say one thing I thought of is that if you want to go now and pay a carbon tax, you can do it. You can go online and there's this page where it will ask you a lot of questions on your lifestyle and it will uh, approximate a carbon tax and then you can, choo you can choose uh, to donate this. Even though the policy is not in place yet, this is like showing you the first steps uh, towards that. I, I can't remember exactly, but it's, I watched the Cowspiracy um, Oh. Documentary and there was a link to it after that, but it's something like carbon tax. Google it and then you find it. The, the whole the whole idea of a tax, the reason that it will work, is it's not voluntary. I mean, sure, you could you could do a lot of voluntary things, but that's just not gonna. Oh sure, yeah. yeah. But if you want to get in on sure. it now, if you think it's a good idea, then you can already start uh, contributing. So, for example, Princeton actually acts as if it had an internal carbon tax already, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons it implemented geothermal like heating system as opposed to a conventional oil. Um, I just want to give a short, um, for the students in the room, um, the Princeton Student Climate Lobby is a group of students planning on um, holding several events for you to get in, engaged with, um, engaged with this issue. Um, we want to make it as easy for you to um, take action on this as possible, and so we'll be holding several study breaks later on in the semester where you can call your congressman, write a letter to them, write a letter to your, your hometown, your home district, um, and there will also be free food. So um, if you guys are interested, um, we uh, stick around and we'll send a sign-up form for that. Um, yeah, but 